few seconds. All right, welcome everyone. My name is Christopher Locke. I'm the IBPM member liaison, and this is the Get to Know Your IBPM Member Benefits webinar series. So we wanna give a more in-depth look at our member benefits. And today we are covering IngramSpark, which is one of our most popular ben member benefits. Uh, so uh, I'll put in the chat again, a detailed explanation in a second of our that webinar benefit. Uh, so let me tell you all a little bit about uh, the, the wonderful folks who are from IngramSpark that are here today. Uh, so we have Justine Bilo, the author acquisitions manager. Hello, Justine. Uh, she manages the author acquisition program at Ingram Spark. She works with authors and independent publishers to explain their flourishing literary platforms through smart sales and marketing strategies. And we also have Josh Floyd, who's the business development manager. Uh, Josh Floyd promotes the growth, sales, and brand of the Ingram Spark platform to independent publishers and publishers, along with providing education to the industry on how to best utilize Ingram Spark's publish on demand services for bringing a new book to market or for breathing life into an out of print title. All right, so they're gonna be the ones giving the presentation. I'm gonna disappear in a second and I cannot tell you all how much I appreciate you for being here. Uh, so welcome. Thanks for having us, Christopher. Yes, and thank you all for joining us today. We're very happy to have the opportunity to speak with you. So I'll get started through uh, going through some of the uh, subtitles you see there. We're going to talk about distributing like a pro today using Ingram Spark. We're going to cover Ingram and what a wholesale model's like, POD, which stands for print on demand, the importance of metadata and how it relates to discoverability. And then we're going to share some retail insights to give you some tips and tricks to uh, be more successful in the retail and library markets. So to get started, we already know who I am and who Justine is. So let's talk about what Ingram is and what is a wholesale model. For many of you, you may not be familiar with Ingram Book Company, which is okay. Ingram is one of the world's largest and most trusted global and wholesaler of books. So we both uh, are a wholesaler and a distributor across all of our brands within Ingram. So currently we carry over 16 million titles available from Ingram. And those titles get to us from 30,000 plus traditional publishers and 100,000 plus indie publishers who are all uploading uh, their, their data to Ingram to make their books available to all of Ingram's 40,000 plus retail and library customers. So that on the next screen, you'll see it covers Ingram's channels, which is global and chain bookstores. It's independent retailers, independent bookshops, university bookshops, internet retailers, gift retailers, museums, public and school libraries alike. So just about anywhere you see books sold has access to ordering their books from Ingram, which, is, which makes it so important for you to be working directly with Ingram so that your books are available across all the possible channels out there for your readers to discover your books. We also are an ebook distributor as well. So one of the uh, advantages of working with Ingram Spark is it is a one-stop shop for both your print and ebook distribution. And we've actually upgraded our ebook distribution services over the past year to include the library market, Hoopla, and some other uh, avenues that we have not currently had before within the ebook distribution channels of Ingram. So we'll definitely want to check those out on the website uh, whenever you go in and start, you know, looking more into Ingram Spark for yourselves. So Ingram Spark, what is that? So our mission statement is empowering publishing success by connecting content creators with a global audience. Our goal is to get your books where they need to be across the world and into the hands of their readers or the retailers who are interested in buying your books. So let's talk about some of the advantages of using Ingram Spark. As I mentioned, it's a one-stop platform for both print and ebook distribution services. It's free to open an Ingram Spark account. You can go to www.ingramspark.com and go through the process of opening an account, which is free to do. All you'll need to have is a credit card and a checking account available to get your account open. So when you're working with Ingram Spark, we are simply printing and shipping the books at the most base service that we offer. We are printing and shipping the books where they need to go, which makes you the publisher. So you are in complete control of all the aspects of your, of your business, your publishing business and your titles. You control the retail prices that you want on your books. You control the market discounts that you're going to set for Ingram to turn around and sell these books to their uh, retailers and libraries at the discounts they're used to getting. And we'll go further into the discount discussion in some later slides. 
And again, with us, you're able to set your book as returnable or non-returnable. So we have multiple return options that we'll also discuss later. But just something to keep in mind, you are the publisher. You have control of all this. We are simply your logistics, printing and shipping the books through Print On Demand. So for those of you who are not familiar with Print On Demand, what that means is we keep your books digitally on our servers, and we do not print those books until an order comes in from the market, which is Ingram ordering books from us to supply their retailers and libraries who are ordering your titles, or you, the publisher or author, ordering books for yourself through your Ingram Spark account. And that means you could go in and place an order all the way down to one copy since it's print on demand. There's no minimum unit quantities on these orders. So if you needed three or four books shipped to you, you could go in and place an order, put in your address and have them shipped to you. We also will drop ship those books anywhere they need to go. So if I'm in California and I have somebody in Florida that I'd like to send 20 copies to, maybe it's a school teacher I'm working with and I, it's a connection I made. I can literally go into my Ingram Spark account place an order for 20 copies, put in that teacher's final shipping address, and we will print, pick, pack, and ship those books to that address in an unmarked box with the return information being your information. Ingram or Ingram Spark is not written anywhere in that paperwork. It literally looks like it came from your warehouse, so you can be as professional as possible when you're doing your publishing ventures. With print on demand, your content is always available. Since there is no stock, your book is always available for print. Uh, the way it works is we actually prioritize orders that come in through Ingram from the market. So we get those books out within 24 to 48 business hours of being ordered by a retailer or library. And there again, that's both brick and mortar and online. We have the widest global reach through our channel partners. So we own our printing facilities in the US, UK and Australia. And then we have another 22 plus printing partners around the world that we work with to make sure your books are getting where they need to be in a timely manner. As we mentioned earlier, we have over 40,000 retailers and libraries that order from Ingram on any given day. Or we have the, one of the largest networks of ebook online retailers as well, including all the big ones, Amazon, Apple, Kobo, and now the library market. Another benefit of going through us is a lot of you folks actually go to Amazon or Apple directly for your ebook services, which is fine. So you can use our platform to reach all the other ebook retailers outside of Amazon and Apple and actually opt out of them with us. And the beauty of that is, is it's a one stop. So if I make a change to my ebook cover, or I make a change to my print book interior files, or I update a new cover, the very next book that goes out into the world from Ingram is that most updated content. And with it being a one stop shop, when you make those ebook updates, we're going to update that across all the retailers that we work with. So you don't have to have individual relationships and make individual edits at all these different online retailers. You can do that once within the Ingram Spark platform and we'll update it across all of our various channels. So let's talk about print on demand and distribution and how it works. As we mentioned, the first thing you would need to do is open up an Ingram Spark account, which is free to do. The next thing you'd want is to be able to upload your print files and your ebook digital files. For ebooks, we highly recommend using a flowable EPUB file. That way it, we can reach the, uh, the most amount of retailers. So there's a lot of retailers only require flowable EPUBs and cannot work with fixed format files. So we always recommend having that flowable EPUB file so you can reach the greatest channels of online retailers for your eBooks. For the print books, you wanna have your uh, final PDFs. You wanna have your cover file and your interior book block file. And if you're gonna set that book up for distribution, you're gonna to have to have an ISBN as well. We, we offer both paid for ISBNs and free ISBNs through Ingram Spark. We are a retail uh, partner of Balker. So for those of you located in the US, B-O-W-K-E-R, Balker is the agency for registering ISBNs to authors and publishers in the US. We actually work directly with Balker. So if you buy an ISBN through Ingram Spark, it is being registered with Balker as the same as purchasing directly from Balker. And then there again, we offer free ISBNs for those who are, who are just comfortable using Ingram Spark. The only caveat is, is you can't use that free ISBN at other services, Whereas if you own your own ISBN, you can use it at all the different services that are available to you. Which brings me to another important point. Ingram Spark is non-exclusive. We are meant to be just another tool in your publishing belt. So you can use us in any other services that are out there and available to you. With Ingram Spark, you can set your book for pre-orders and global pricing. Currently right now, uh, KDP doesn't really offer pre-order services. And if you go to them and ask for the pre-order methods, they're gonna tell you to go to Ingram Spark. So with us, you can do more of a traditional rollout. And this is something Justine will talk about a little later, 
but you can do more of a traditional rollout where you're ramping up your marketing and media before the book launch date. So what happens is, is you open your account, you've uploaded your digital files, whether for print or ebook, and now you can turn distribution on. So what will happen is once you upload your print files, let's talk about print books specifically, you'll upload the files, our team will process those files to make sure that they are compliant with our printing specifications, and then you'll receive an email with a PDF copy of that book. Really review that PDF, don't skip that part, because what happens is, is that's a great opportunity for you to go through and read and make sure that you don't have any edits or typos within the book block interior that you could fix before you turn the book on for printing. Once you turn the book on for printing and you wanna make any changes, that's then considered submitting revisions, which sometimes come with a fee. And so what you wanna do is make sure that you're taking advantage of going through that PDF and catching any little mistakes that you possibly can before you get to the print version of that book. Once you've reviewed the PDF and you say, hey, this part looks good to me, I'm gonna turn the book on for printing. At that point, you can order some copies for yourself. I highly recommend uh, ordering three or four copies for yourself so you can see the book, book printed multiple times. You can review the book, make sure you like the spine, the cover, and that there's no glaring typos or edits within the, the interior pages that stick out to you. Once you've got those copies and you look them over and say, hey, I like this book, it looks good to go, I'd like to turn it on to the world, you can enable that book for distribution for free. And at that point, we will put it in Ingram's catalog of the 16 million plus titles. That book will post at amazon.com and barnesandnoble.com for purchase. And then Ingram will fulfill those orders on the back end whenever they come in from those type of retailers. Ingram sends the book metadata to the other online sites, Amazon, Apple, BNN, especially for your eBooks. There's, there's a whole host of online retailers out there. Ingram's customers can order your book from Ingram. Ingram will fulfill that order on your behalf and what happens is, is, say an independent bookstore orders your title from Ingram, Ingram will get that book to the independent bookstore, and we at Ingram Spark will pay you a publisher compensation for that sale. And we'll dive a little bit more into the publisher compensation a little later as well. There again, we use POD, print on demand. The books are not printed until they are ordered. And we deliver the print and ebook content to the retailers, of which we pay you once those sales take place. So why POD makes sense? There's no inventory to manage. There's no warehousing costs. There's no guesswork regarding potential demand. You're not having to invest in a five to 10,000 unit print run hoping to sell through all those titles or all those copies. What you can do is make that book available and you're only gonna sell the books that actually sell. So you're not sitting on any type of overstock. There's no orders to pack and ship. We handle that for you. And then you have access to the largest global distribution network of retailers and libraries across the world. You can revise your titles at any time. You can revise the files. Say you get a cool blurb or a cool review you want to put on your cover. You can upload that new cover image to your Ingram Spark account, and the very next book printed will have that new review that you've put on there. And then we have fast turnaround times. As I mentioned, for books going to the market, we're at a 24 to 48 hour turnaround time to make sure that these retailers are getting the books in an extremely timely manner. And then typically for us, you'll see whenever you're placing orders through Ingram Spark, the different turnaround times for print and shipping that you can choose based on how quickly you need the books. So things to know about distribution. Distribution takes some time depending on the distribution partner. So one of the things to note that, uh, that comes up a lot with our customer service department is you've turned that book on for distribution, but yet the very next day you don't see it at Amazon or you don't see it at Barnes & Noble. So what happens when you turn the book on for distribution is we are sending that metadata out within four to six hours of you turning that book on. What happens is we need the retailers receiving the metadata to update their websites with all this new information they are receiving. So where we can't control is we can't say how fast Amazon or Barnes & Noble will populate that book on their sites. You may see it come in chunks and pieces where it's just the image or it's just some of the metadata or just the pricing. You just have to give those retailers time to catch up with all the new information that we send them on a daily basis to update their sites. You still have to market your book so people know where to buy it. We are not out actually hand selling or physically selling your titles to folks. What we're doing is taking the orders that come in and getting them back out. So as the publisher, you would want to be out there marketing and promoting your book and letting your readers know where those books are available. You tell the retailers and library your book is available from Ingram. So say you have an independent bookstore or a U.S. library or a Barnes & Noble that's interested in carrying your book, you would tell those folks, hey, my book's available from Ingram, and they'll know exactly what you mean and how to order that title. Retailers and libraries prefer to order from Ingram. 
In the wholesale model, this allows a bookstore or a library to order all the publisher's titles they need across the spectrum in one order on one invoice and one shipment. So not only can they order your titles, but they can also order the Penguin Random House, the Macmillan, the Simon & Schuster titles as well, so that all their books are coming in a very concise, uh, consolidated format for them to receive at their, their various locations. There again, Ingram's not directly selling your book into the stores, we're just fulfilling the orders as they come in. And then changes to the metadata. So you can, like I said, you can up to, uh, load new cover files. You can upload interior files if you happen to see some edits or typos within that interior block that you want to fix. You can change your retail price. You can change the market discount, which again, we're going to discuss here in a little bit. But you may start out with a lower discount, which is not appealing to the brick and mortar stores. And then once you start garnering uh, attention from those brick and mortar stores who would like to see that book sold at a regular discount, you can go in and update your discount and your retail price accordingly and your return status. We make those changes once a week on Friday. So that's something that, uh, that we used to do only once a month, but with the need and um, for speed, we've been able to do that once a week now. And then we're gonna to go to pre-distribution advice for indie authors. And Justine, I'm gonna let you jump in and take over for a second. Awesome, sorry, I was busily answering questions while you were talking, Josh. Um, so there are some tips that I like to give authors uh, before you even uh, start publishing. Uh, and so the first one I always love to give is please work with professionals if you want your book to look professional. If you're already a part of IBPA, I have a feeling that you guys are already doing this, but I'm just going to reiterate it. And this means investing in editors and designers and your marketing because at the end of the day, this is what is going to, to give your book a very professional feel and will not, uh, and it will be your calling card. So uh, we always like to say invest in these things and not inventory because print on demand has come so far in terms of quality and also in terms of logistics that it is so great to not have to be able to not have to store you know a couple thousand books in your garage that and then figure out how to distribute those a couple thousand books that it is totally worth it to to put that money that you would spend in an upfront print run in a very good editor in a very good cover etc so please uh think about what is worth it at the end of the day also social media is something that I can attest as someone who writes is, can be a, a pain, but <laughs> we all have to do it in order to build our author platforms. So my suggestion is to start small, start with some one platform to try to build your readership. And then you can build out from there. Uh, you're trying to find your readers. Not everyone is going to be your audience. So, you know, start to figure out where your readers live. If you're a romance author or a romance publisher, Facebook may be the place for you. If you publish political books, Twitter is probably the place for you. So try to figure out where your audience lives and then start to build that readership on that platform. And then maybe you can, you know, broach TikTok uh, and dip your toes into that water. Also, you don't know how your readers like to read or where they like to purchase. So this is why I think that options are key. So me personally, I'm a hardcover reader. Uh, I sit on a beach half the summer and sun and sunscreen and salt water are really hard on my books. So I, bar I always buy my books in hardcover. However, you know, your readers might be paperback readers or ebook readers. The point is give them the option. So we can make books available in hardcover, paperback, and e. Why not do all three? Also, people have some very weird brand allegiances when it comes to buying books. So you're going to have those people who only buy books on Amazon, and then those people who only buy books at Barnes & Noble and will never buy a book on, on Amazon, or those people who only buy books at their independent bookstores. So this is why why distribution is so important, because you don't want to alienate any of your readers because or potential readers 
because that distribution option is not available to them or that retail option is not available to them. So this is what we call being retailer agnostic, give them choices. And last but not least, we network professionally, which if you guys are already a part of IBPA, you're, you're doing. And if you're not a part of IBPA, please join because communities like this are really important for not only learning and continuing that education, but also having a camaraderie amongst other independent uh, publishers and, and authors and, you know, knowing that you're in this together. And, uh, Metadata is also going to be terribly important, but I'm going to touch on that in just a little bit. All right, let's let Justine go on about why is metadata important and why does it matter and what is metadata? The most important thing about metadata is that it directly equates to the discoverability of your titles. So metadata is a very scary word. Uh, but really it just means information about your book. And this is as simple as your book title, but there are several pieces of information that, uh, any, any, uh, website is going to ask you for. So this means for on Ingram spark, we're going to ask you for your book title, title, your author bio, your book description. These are all pieces of metadata and optimizing them for search on searching on the internet is going to be really important, especially now in our digital world, when we are buying most of our things online. Although that is changing now because things are opening back up, which is very exciting. So here are some pieces of metadata. So we're talking about your book title, your author bio. One of the things I wanna call out here is your physical location as an author. This is a very important because local bookstores are looking for these pieces of information. And also if people are searching for, you know, books about Wyoming and you happen to live in Wyoming and written a book about it, that is a very searchable piece of information. So having that as part of your metadata is going to help with your discoverable discoverability. So BISAC codes, these are also known as subject codes. And so the book industry study group or BISG has all of these codes that essentially determine where a book goes on a shelf. So you have to try to think where your book would fit on a shelf. And the more specific you get, the better. We hate general uh, bisect codes because really you're putting yourself in a very, very broad category. And it's harder to find books in a very broad category. So um, please be descriptive in these. So if you're writing thriller, uh, and you want to make sure that you're discoverable in thriller categories, don't just pick thriller general, pick um, thriller, uh, 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 historical, uh, you know, get more, get more in depth. Keywords are also becoming more and more important, like I said, in our digital world. These are things that people would Google in order to find your book or put into that Amazon search bar, what have you. So you have to kind of think in keywords and phrases as a reader. And so again, this is phrases. So you are kind of getting into the minds of your reader when you are thinking of these keywords. And then also integrating these keywords into your description is going to make these keywords even richer because then they will bring you higher up in the discoverability. Audience is also going to be important because um, if you have picked uh, juvenile BISAC codes um, because you've written a children's book, your audience range has to reflect that. So please keep that in mind. Um, obviously you need an ISBN. Um, many people offer free ones. We do. We highly suggest that you, uh, own your own from Bowker, like Josh mentioned earlier. Um, pricing is also a piece of metadata. So, uh, I answered in the chat. Yes. Ingram is global distribution. We have print facilities in the U S UK and Australia, as well as print partners globally. So the, Metadata for your pricing if, is also important because if you put a price in that market, we will distribute to that market. Um, 
metadata even comes down to the size of your book, what color or what color paper you choose, the if it's matte or glossy cover, uh, all of this matters. We will talk a little bit more about retail discount and returnability, but again, pieces of metadata. And last but not least, your publication date or your on sale date. I have an entire slide on this, so I'll keep going. Yeah, and I'm going to add a little bit to this in that um, I actually come from the books, independent bookstore world from Ingram. I was an independent book rep for uh, Ingram for many, many years, covering the stores in about 15 different states and, and, and beyond. And so a couple of the key attributes you're going to see here is audience. Justine mentioned it earlier. Being very specific about that audience range not only helps target the readers who are looking for this book, but it also helps bookstores and libraries position the book where it needs to be so that it's most discoverable by the readers who fit that category. You may feel that your book is appropriate for ages nine to 90, but that's not the case. You have a demographic that you are out to, to market to and out to sell these titles to. So the more you can hone in on that demographic and, and know exactly who you're trying to reach, the more success, uh, successful you'll be because retailers will be able to position that book to target those type of audiences. And I'll go ahead and jump into the retail discounts a little bit. So when you're going through Ingram Spark and you're setting up your titles, you're going to be asked to put in your retail price for the book. You're also going to be asked to put in a market discount. And as you can see, the range for market discount is 30 to 55 percent. So what the market discount really is, is you, the publisher, offering Ingram, the wholesaler, a discount off the retail price so that Ingram can turn around and sell that book to their customers at a discount that they are used to getting from Ingram. So that sounds kind of convoluted, but it's, it's something that all publishers have to do and all industries have to do when you're working about selling your products into wholesalers. And so a 30 to 55% discount has different meaning. So if I am gonna be out promoting my book to brick and mortar stores, and they and I, I want I want to see my book on shelves. I'm going to have to put a minimum of a 53% discount on that title so that Ingram can sell it to these brick and mortar retailers at the discounts that they are used to getting from Ingram. What happens a lot in conversations uh, out in the field is you'll hear a bookstore tell an author, "Hey, I need at least a 40% discount on this title." And what they're saying is, I need to be able to order this book from Ingram at a minimum of 40% discount. Well, in order for that retailer to be able to do that, you as the publisher have to sell that book into Ingram at a 53 to 55% discount, 53 being as low as you can go in the US market, 48% being as low as you can go in the rest of world market, the Europe, Australia, and other markets outside of the US. If I'm going to be driving people online, and when I say online, I don't mean just Amazon or just Barnes & Noble. Your independent bookstores also have their own websites and their own online presences. So you should definitely mention them in your marketing materials, too, so that you are driving titles across, across the market, even though they are online sales. But if my approach is to drive people online to buy the book from whatever retailer um, I'm suggesting, then I can go, get away with what we call a shorter discount. It's a discount smaller than 53%. So I can put a 40% discount on my title and make more per sale. And this is what I was talking about earlier is, especially if I'm a debut author who really doesn't have a following or a track record having brick and mortar sales, I may come out with that shorter discount because I know that these books of mine are going to predominantly sell online. And I know that I can make more per sale because I'm offering less of a discount. And then once I start garnering attention from the brick and mortar, say a Barnes & Noble is interested in carrying my title or an independent bookstore is interested in carrying my book, they're gonna, I'm going to be informed that, hey, I need to raise my discount so that I can sell books on shelves to these brick and mortar stores. And then that, that point, as the publisher, you can make a business decision and say, okay, I'm either happy with the online sales success I'm having, or one of my dreams is to see my book on the shelves in bookstores. And there's obviously... Um, attention for my title, there's demand for it. So I am gonna move my discount up to that 53% so that the bookstores can buy at the same discount that they buy every other publisher's title out there, whether it's indie or traditional. And then on the returnable, non-returnable status, it's very important to retailers, brick and mortar, to have the book be returnable. So they wanna be able to get the full regular discount they're used to getting, and they wanna be able to return that book in case it doesn't sell. 
for a retailer, this is like buying stock. I am buying a piece of stock that I am going to put on my limited shelves, hoping that it sells and that I can re make a return on my investment. But if I cannot sell this book and the publisher is not able to drive foot traffic to my store to buy these books, then I need to be able to return them to the wholesaler, which I bought them, so I can recoup as much money as I possibly can, so I can turn around and buy a book that will sit on my shelf and sell. Uh, retailers are retailers. They are there to sell product and they pay attention to the product that sells and they need to have product on their shelves that does sell. And so that was just a little more in depth to what the discount and return status mean. And so here's some examples of the metadata being flown out into the world. This is what Ingram uh, catalog looks like. This is Ingram's iPage. So if you're ever standing there in a brick and mortar location or a library and you're trying to tell them about your book, or you're in there looking for a book yourself. And you say, I don't know the title, it just came out. It's got a blue cover. It's got big white bold light uh, writing on it. It's a paperback. What they're doing is they're actually in, and you see them clicking on the computer, they're actually in Ingram's catalog doing just that. Those words you're saying, those phrases you're using to describe the book, the keywords that Justine mentioned earlier, or the description, what they're doing is they're in that search engine searching those keywords, searching for the title, searching for the ISBN. And when they find it, it'll populate on their screen just like this. So this is a book that we did, the Ingram Spark Guide to Independent Publishing. We've actually been updating our websites, as a lot of you may have noticed, if you're Ingram Spark customers. So there will be a new book coming out once the website uh, upgrades have been done. But as a retailer, I can see everything I need to about this book on one page. I can see the title. I can see the publishing name. I can see that highlighted discount reg, which tells me I get my regular Ingram discount on this book. I can see the inventory stock levels over there. Since it's print on demand, we're going to have arbitrary numbers there so that it's always in stock. I can see the publication date. I can see the marketing that this publisher is doing. So I know that the, the publisher is actually doing their part to market this title and drive people out to buy it. I can see all that information I need right there on one screen in Ingram's catalog. And then the same goes for other online retailers. Same book, same metadata populating in Amazon. They're again populating at barnesandnoble.com. That metadata is going out to all these retailers and it's just so important to have the most robust, precise metadata you can to make these searches more discoverable for your title. So let's talk about setting your book up for success. Justine, do you wanna do the pricing and returns? I surely can. You just talked a little bit about this, but uh, the so here's what you need to know about pricing and returns. Like I said, if you want to have global distribution, all you need to do is add a price in that country to enable distribution. Uh, the rule of thumb is to do the dollar for dollar exchange in that country and then add a dollar or two in that currency. So if your price is $14.99 in the US and that works out to 1643 pounds, round up to 1699 pounds and then add a dollar or two or add a pound or two um, for currency fluctuation. Um, so that is rule of thumb. Uh, a wholesale discount, like Josh said, is the discount needed to sell your book into the market so that that retailer uh, will buy your book. Uh, if it is a full trade discount, which is the 53 to 55%, that is preferred because that helps that brick and mortar bookstore make money. If it is a short discount, the 30 to 52%, um, they are getting less of a discount. Um, I'm answering a question in the Q&A right now. Um, this is dependent on the retailer's class of trade. Everyone has a different class of trade that they fall into, and they have a different negotiated discount with the wholesale company. So this this can vary depending on that bookstore or retailer. And then for returns, we have um, a few different options. We have non-returnable, which no books will come back. Um, we have then return and destroy, which means that if they come back to us, we will destroy them for you for no charge. And then we have return and ship, which means that they are then shipped back to you for $2 per book. The way returns work is that you are then charged the wholesale price of the book. So if a store paid $10 for that book, you are then charged $10 for that book. So even if you only made $3 on that book, so always keep that in mind. It is a risk. It is a gamble. So if you truly believe that your audience is buying books from bricks, brick and mortar bookstores, 
then returns are important to them. If you don't feel that your audience is there, then being non-returnable is okay. If it is always easiest to start non-returnable and then decide to change your mind and go returnable, do not do the other way around. Um, because we have to then tell retailers that this book is now non-returnable and they tend to dump stock on us. So keep that in mind. If you are at all hesitant, start non-returnable. Uh, next slide, Josh. So we also have some really great calculators to help you figure out the price of your book and how much you'll make per book, how much it costs to print and ship that book. Um, and you can just find them at ingramspark.com. So one is the publisher compensation calculator. That's how much you will make per sale if that book is sold through a retailer. And then one is the print and ship calculator, which is if you need, you know, 10 copies for a conference, how much those 10 copies will cost to print and then ship them to wherever you need them to go. Um, and here are our book types. So we do paperback, hardcover, which is just, uh, we can do either just the case laminate or with a dust jacket or, and we can do the, our digital cloth with the dust jacket or our case laminate with a dust jacket. And we have two types of paper. We have 50 pounds, either cream or white or 70 pounds uh, white. And we do have color printing, standard color or premium color. Um, we have over 30 trim sizes. So the world is your oyster, but I truly do suggest uh, the most popular trim sizes so that they are standard. Uh, people really do like standard trim sizes because a lot of book people are OCD. So keep that in mind. Um, also, don't forget ebooks as a, as a book type. Yeah. And these are actually the options that go into determining your print price. So the binding type, the color, whether it's black and white or color interior, and the trim sizes, whether it's a small, large, or square trim size, plus the page count is what really attributes to the print cost per unit. Uh, whether it's matte or gloss does not change the price. And, and honestly, the paper type does not change the price as much as whether it's color or black and white, not necessarily whether it's cream or white. So those are more aesthetic things for your book that don't necessarily equate into the print price. But in the printing and shipping calculator, you'll see all those different options there for you to choose. And also something to mention about the trim sizes, about going most popular. You saw on the screen earlier for uh, pre-distribution advice, going standard with trim sizes. There, it's really important to do that because there are certain genres that, that are read by readers uh, with the uh, assumption that they're gonna get the same trim size for that genre, like mass, paper, or mass market readers are expecting that smaller, slimmer trim size. Bookstores and library shelves are actually built to accommodate certain trim sizes. So the five by eights, the six by nines uh, for your children's titles, the seven by tens or eight and a half by 11s or the square books that you see uh, called out there. Those are really important because those shelves are built to handle those type of books. If you start doing odd trim sizes that are, that are beyond these most popular ones, what happens is there's not a place for them on these books on the shelves. So a lot of times if you go into a bookstore, you may see like a random pile of books on the floor out by a shelf. And you're like, well, what is this? And there you pick them up and they're all just kind of odd trim sizes. The reason they're laying there is because there's nowhere on the shelves for these books to fit. So you definitely want to go down to your library or your bookstore and look at the genres that you're writing in and get a feel for the most common trim sizes in those genres. And let's do a, an example here of the publisher compensation that you've heard us talking about. So in this example, as the publisher, I'm setting a retail price of $20, and I'm interested in marketing to brick and mortar store, so I'm going to go ahead and set my terms up at a full discount, meaning I'm putting that 53% discount on there. Well, what I'm saying is, hey, Ingram, anytime this book sells to one of your retailers, I want to take a 53% off that $20 retail price for you to turn around and sell it which means Ingram is buying that book from you, the publisher, at $9.40. Well, then they're going to turn around and sell it to the market at $20 minus, because that's the retail price you set, minus you know whatever discount that class of trade is getting from Ingram. Us at Ingram Spark, we are the printer. We make money uh, when we print books, no bones about it. The more books we get to print, the better it is for, uh, for our profit and the better it is for you because you're selling more books. So this is why we do so much work in education and trying to help publishers be as savvy as possible, because we want you to sell as many books as possible. But in this scenario, you'll see the retail price of 20, 
minus the discount, meaning the wholesaler is buying it for $9.40 from you, the publisher. We're just facilitating the sale. And then we make $4.81 on this particular book that's 300 pages and six by nine. So every time that book sells, we make $4.81. That leaves $4.59 in compensation paid to you. And we pay 90 days from the end of the month in which the sale took place. So if your book sold, if you sold some copies on January 2nd and then January 20th, we're going to calculate all the sales you had in the month of January and do a direct deposit to your checking account 90 days after the end of January, after January 31st. And obviously, on the publisher compensa uh, compensation calculator, you can play with these numbers. There again, I could put in the same scenario and change the wholesale discount and watch how that calculation changes everything so I can see my publisher compensation either go up as I lower the discount or go down as I raise the discount. So a lot of times you may have to raise your, your print price just a little bit if you start going up in discount to compete in different market spaces. So just something to be aware of. And then Justine, uh, let's do your pre-sale and pre-order. Okay, so we do offer pre-sales up to a year in advance of your publication date. Um, here are some things that you need to know if you are going to do this. We ask you for two dates. We ask you for your pub date and your on sale date. These dates should be the same date. If you take anything away from this talk, please make those dates the same date in the future. So if I am publishing a book on October 1st, then both my pub date and my on sale date should be the same date. And so we start printing and shipping books 10 business days prior to that on sale date. So if you need to make any changes to your files, please do them well in advance of 10 business days before your pub date on sale date. Otherwise, we will print the wrong files and it has been done before. So please, please, please make any changes at least a month in advance of that pub date on sale date. And, and something also else to be aware of that, sorry, Justine, something else to be aware of that that a lot of people don't understand is that when you go in to make a revision, that book is no longer available for sale to the market until the book is approved by you on the revision. So you may have some back orders in the system at an online retailer or at a bookstore. And what happens is if you go in, you know, especially with that, before, you know, three weeks prior to pub date and you start changing those files, what happens is those books no longer show available to, to the market because the book's in revision status and it's technically not available for print. So you want to be as far out as Justine mentioned in getting your revisions in before the launch date so that you do not risk any losing any of the pre-orders that you may have built up until that point. So there again, it's just it's highly important to be as ahead of the game as you can when you're doing pre-order campaigns. Sorry. And if you are actually doing a pre-order campaign, please market the pre-order campaign. Otherwise, you're just putting the book out there. It's just sitting. Please, please, please market it. And this means again, be retailer agnostic, send out advanced reader copies, get reviews, um, send readers into the stores to order, to pre-order the book. Please do a concerted effort to make that pre-order worth it. Um, so th that's my, my soapbox about pre-orders. And so there's a, Josh, there's a ton of questions too. So maybe we should just start okay. answering questions. Yeah, we can definitely do that. I'll speak to these last three or four here because we're just going to uh, touch on some things we've already talked about. So if you're looking to check the, you know, what type of retail price you should set on your book, what we do is recommend looking at comp titles, comparable titles. Go down to your local uh, brick and mortar bookstore, whether it's a chain or independent, go to this genre shelf that your book would sit on. Look at the other titles on that shelf. Look at the range of prices. You'll have a low end, you'll have a high end. You don't want to be on the low end. You want to fall somewhere in the middle to 75% range of the low end to high end. You just don't want to bottom the price out on your book because you're cutting margin and devaluing your content. And you don't want to outprice your book for that genre range and have a higher price than readers are used to paying. And then the rest of this, we've kind of already went over, you know, talking about the discounted prices, uh, having your full trade discount. Uh, if you're going to be selling to brick and mortars, your Amazon, uh, your Amazon number listings or any success at Amazon does not translate into brick and mortar or library sales because it's two different audiences. They're really concerned about foot traffic and how you're actually gonna be driving foot traffic to their store or library. And as we mentioned earlier, anywhere books are sold is your best uh, retail agnostic uh, listing that you can put on your marketing materials because 
literally, I could walk into a bookstore that's not carrying your book on the shelf, but if it's available through Ingram, I can still purchase that book as a reader, just as a special order. So your book is available for sale there. It's just not sitting on the shelf. Library success, uh, library journal. That's the best way to get your books into libraries is make sure you have a great library journal review. It's basically a Bible for them. And if you've got a good review from library journal, you'll have a very good success rate of getting into libraries as well. And then let's jump into the questions there, Justine. All right. Uh, I, Christopher, I just, do you want to, do you have them set up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can help you all with that. Uh, so first off, thank you so much. That was incredible information. Uh, I learned a lot too. So thank you for that. Okay, so I'm looking at the Q&A and people upvoted. So I'm starting with the most voted to the least. Um, <clears throat> The, the number one thing that people seem to have some difficulty with is reaching customer service and um, it's because it's through email. Um, I think, you know, people like having that face to face. That's why this webinar is so popular because they're, they're directly right with you. So uh, one question is like, what should they do about this, you know, in terms of trying to reach you all with questions and problems um, and also get, you know, answer back in a timely manner. Yeah, I'll take that. So the customer, our customer support team, uh, I'm telling you all, they're, they're saints doing, uh, doing some Lord's work there. Uh, so what happened, honestly, is we have always had stellar customer service, and I have saw some of that in the questions and answers of how it used to be compared to, to where it's been currently. And trust us, our customer service team is working around the clock to do the best they can to keep up with the massive amounts of volume that we have coming in. So uh, in short, what happened last year is we did what we call the new UI UX, user interface, user interface, user experience update, where we were updating the website and updating the um, updating the computer workings behind what runs our website and our, our operations from an IT standpoint. Well, some of those things hadn't been updated in 20 years since the birth of Lightning Source. So when you start putting in new changes, there were some bugs and things that came out of those changes that were unexpected. Well, not not knowing that we were rolling out this upgrade at the same time that a worldwide pandemic was going to hit landed within the same month of each other. So all of a sudden, not only did we have a website that had some bugs in it that used to just work functionally fine, maybe not as aesthetically nice, but functionally it was working just fine. Well, now when you start updating some of these codes on the back end, uh, there's, there's functionality issues that obviously arise. And so you have to address those when you can. So now we have folks who are used to using our systems, really hitting up customer support saying, hey, why can't I do this? This doesn't work. Well, then on top of that, we had COVID that hit. So now every, we're there again, we're a global company. So every single writer just about in the world was at home writing, creating content and uploading books and, and, and having time to actually do this work. So without a, adding any head count or any staff to our customer support team, all of a sudden they were hit with all these new upgrades to the website that they're trying to work through and help folks with. And then they were also hit with every writer in the world being at home and having time to contact us. So what we're honestly, what happened is we got so backed up in volume on the chat and phone calls that we had to move to email only to catch back up. And we were, I'm not going to lie, we were weeks behind on, on that volume. But when we moved to email, we were able to catch up and within the past month or two we've been able to get it to be turnaround time of 24 to 72 business hours from our customer support team and so we've had to roll with that just because the increased volume now that doesn't mean that we have looked at going away from phones and chats forever we have uh, weekly meetings about the type of data we're getting from uh, those communications so it is something that we are steadily working towards we finally have gotten to add new staff so we have new customer support reps coming on every week what I would suggest, especially in the interim while we're doing emails, is to give as much information as you possibly can in that first email to customer support so you can help these folks out because they are digging through literally hundreds of thousands of accounts with issues of various degrees, whether it's files, whether it's an order, whether it's a quality of print issue. So what you want to do is be as, as, as accommodating to them as you can to help move the process along faster. For instance, always include your Ingram Spark account number in your email. A lot of folks will just email us and it's just their name and email address. So now you have to go in as a customer support rep and go find that email address, find the account that it's linked to, find which ISBN they're talking about. Whereas if you communicate with them up front, hey, this is my account number. This is the ISBN I have an issue with, whether it's a file issue, whether it's an order issue, make sure you clearly state that. 
if it's a quality of print issue, I mean, we're always happy to replace copies, especially if it's our fault on the printing end. What you want to go ahead and do when you're writing in about those is say, here's my account number, here's the ISBN, here's the web order number in question, and here attached are some photos of, of the defects that I found in the printing. And always, if you look at your Ingram Spark printed books, and this is Lightning Source printed books across the board for Ingram Spark and our traditional publishers who use Lightning Source, that very last page, that very last leaf on the back page, the bottom left corner is a barcode. That barcode will tell us exactly what time that book was printed on what machine it was printed and who was running the machine at the time. So if you're having any type of quality issues as far as the printing goes, be sure to include any of the pictures of the defects and, and go ahead and include in a picture of that barcode on the back because there's so much information hidden in that barcode for us. So there again, it's just being as preemptive as you can with customer to support so that they can streamline the process because if they don't have all that information up front, it's, it's just, it's a lot of digging through our systems and a lot of back and forth with questions that were going to cause more emails for you back and forth. Whereas if they have all that up front, it's a lot easier for them to resolve an issue. Um, and then there again, we do have escalation processes. So if you don't feel like it's getting answered the way that you, you know, to a suffice manner, you can ask for an escalation and it does move up the ladder based on the, the, the serious of the need for being worked on. Uh, but Ingram Spark is built as a DIY website. So I see a lot of you saying, how can I have face-to-face -face conversations? Something to keep in mind is that our, where Justine and I do these type of educations as publishing consultants, we're not actually, Ingram Spark is not set up as a consultant. We're educating as much as we can, but our, our customer service staff is literally there as a utilitarian method of getting the orders out, getting uh, replacement orders placed and getting files processed. They are not industry professionals who have all the types of information that you may be asking uh, from a publishing perspective because they're not publishers themselves. So anything that you can do to take a look at this screen right here, we have our podcast that we offer, which is Justine hosting it. It's 15 minute bursts. You can listen to them anywhere podcasts are available. It's called Go Publish Yourself. And it's one of the top rated self-publishing podcasts out there. So what we do is she brings in industry experts to talk about very specific topics, whether it's selling to Indies, selling to Barnes and Noble, selling to libraries, what's metadata, why is, you know, how do you build your readership? We bring in experts to talk about these in 15 minute bursts and they're, they're highly educational. She also has an author highlight series where she talks to authors who are indie authors who've been ex extreme, extremely successful. And so they come on and they talk about some of the pitfalls that they've gone through and, and some of the things that made them successful. I I also have a, uh, a now a monthly series on Instagram live that's called coffee with Justine Absolutely. and essentially it's me talking about a topic for like 15 minutes and then people get to rapid fire ask me questions through a comment section on Instagram for the next 40 it is it makes me sweat every month, but it is a great way to like ask me your like your burning questions and have an audience so if you truly truly do have questions that need to be answered pretty quickly that's once a month and definitely check it out um, at ingram spark books on instagram and then we offer the other education that you see there our blog is uh it, it's very well renowned the, the open rate is extremely high and that is industry professionals and internal professionals with ingram sharing information and then we have the Ingram Spark Academy, which you can go take too, which is also for free. And our marketing team did a great job of putting that together. It is a online um, college style publishing course that you can take that actually has chapters, quizzes at the end. So it's very much like getting an online education to publishing specifically. So it, that's kind of what we're doing there is trying to do our best to reach the widest audience we can with this education. Um, it's just an, it's, just not set up in a manner to where you can actually have one-on-one -on -one publishing consulting. But there again, also on our resources page, if you're having troubles with creating your files or you need help with cover design, or you need help with editing, or you need help with marketing and selling your title, you can go to ingramspark.com, click on resources and click on the experts. And what you'll find there is a list of companies that you can work with who we vetted. We know they're not predatory. We know they do good work and they offer the services that we do not. So you may be somebody that needs full service help, getting from manuscript to completed book and sold. Those type of companies are there. Or you may need very specific help with just one aspect of your publishing venture. So those are listed there as well. So I highly recommend taking a look at those and taking advantage of those companies that are listed. And they offer uh, discounts to Ingram Spark customers as well.
And uh, Josh, uh, as a special bonus, you're giving out your personal email to answer everyone's questions. Who's oh, on? Yeah, this? yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I'll be Just sure kidding. to share that. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, we do have a lot of other questions, but we'll, yeah, we'll just that. Um, uh, so someone asked, how can I see what my listing looks like to potential buyers? Um, well, what your listing looks like. So on, the, on those screens that I shared earlier of the way it looks in the iPages catalog, it looks exactly like that. It's your cover image plus all the metadata that you've included. So when you're going through your title setup process, You'll see metadata that's starred, that's required from us, and some that are just blank fields. You want to fill in every one of those fields you possibly can, because the more information you're filling out there, the more information that's showing up to that retailer or whoever, that, that reader who's on an online site looking at it. But there again, if you go to an Amazon.com or BarnesandNoble.com, if you go into bookshop.org, which also uh, supports indie bookstores across the country, you can just put in your ISBN and pull it up and see exactly what everybody else is seeing. But as far as the iPage goes, that layout that I showed you of the Ingram Spark title is how every book looks in iPage. The only difference is, is the amount of metadata that a publisher is adding into those tabs that looks different. And uh, they also asked what ads look like to potential buyers. Well, the, the only advertising that we offer through Ingram Spark is our Ingram Advanced catalog. And basically what that is, is a print uh, catalog that goes out to the retailers and libraries who are still signed up for it. And so it's, it's a picture of, uh, it, basically it's a cover image, mostly on black and white uh, interiors. I mean, not interior books, but the catalog itself is mostly black and white interior. But it's a cover image of the books that are coming out from publishers with a little bit of information about that title. And before the advent of things like Edelweiss, which is now the digital version of being able to advertise your book to these retailers and libraries, the, uh, the you know booksellers and librarians would receive this digital or this print catalog at the end of the day, have a glass of wine, and they would go through and highlight the new books that were coming out that looked interesting to them. And so that's what that advanced catalog is. It's just an introduction to say, hey, look at some of these new titles that are coming out into the world. But if you're looking for op opportunities to advertise your book in this digital age, Edelweiss is a great way to go and they offer uh, marketing packages that are a la carte one off. You can go there and work with that team. They're, they're great to work with. And what you are doing is you're reaching their audience of 70,000 plus booksellers, librarians, and bloggers and reviewers who are out there taking all this information in on the new titles. And for those of you who are not familiar with Edelweiss, it's just the digital catalog that us reps use now when we're out hand selling books to, uh, to booksellers and librarians. It's just that it, you can put your DRCs, your digital review copies in there for people to review. You get the email list of people who downloaded your book for review. You can, you can reach list of reviewers and bloggers to get feedback from them. So there's opportunities for other companies out there for you to do your advertising through. It's just not something that is offered through Ingram Spark outside of that advanced catalog right now. Not to say that it's not something that is in the works. We're actually looking, or part of my job is developing relationships with these outside companies and working with them to integrate their, their offerings into our offerings so that you can do all of that yourself in a one-stop shop with an Ingram Spark without having to go to these various companies themselves. You'll see all the different listings there. And that is something that's coming down the road with the, uh, the marketing phase of our UI UX is where you're going to see more marketing and advertising opportunities for you offered by Ingram Spark through these other industry service providers who are reaching and doing the type of work that we're not doing. Yeah, and IBPA does have a member benefit with Edelweiss. I just put the link in there. So there awesome. were some people asking about that. So just look in the chat and you'll find the link. Uh, but yeah, okay. companies like Edelweiss, bookshop.org, uh, you know, PW, Shelf Awareness, those are the traditional advertising avenues for reaching these authors. So there again, if you go to the experts page on Ingram Spark, you'll see these companies listed there that you can get reviews with and you can get advertising opportunities uh, with as well. And uh, so some people were also, uh, well, some people were asking about how you run and, and understand the reports. Uh, so. Yeah, that is uh, always been a clunky process for us, but uh, what's actually happening right now is we're in the process of doing video walkthroughs. So we have a team of folks who are putting together video walkthroughs of how to build the reports and how to walk through those systems. We're uh, gonna be offering more enhanced reporting, especially with this new ebook rolled out. It's gave us the opportunity to work with the IT team to develop better enhanced reporting to give you a better idea of the type of market your books are selling into. 
we can't give the the names. A lot of folks, and I, I mean, I get it as a publishing, I would want this too. But a lot of folks want to know, well, what store bought my book or who specifically bought my book? And the reason we can't share that information is it's nine hours to share. Ingram and Lightning Source, though we operate under the Ingram Content Group umbrella, we're still legally two different entities. And so with the GDPR and the type of restrictions that are available, we're not able to share what Ingram's customers are doing because that's not our customer base. The same as I would never share Ingram Spark account information with another Ingram Spark author or another person that's that belongs to you, the Ingram Spark account holder. Ingram is not able to share the activities of their customer base and what they're buying with an outside entity such as us and then have us disperse that information out into the world. So what we are working on is more robust, uh, easier, first off, easier walkthroughs for building the reports. You'll see some what we call walk me pop ups where it'll walk you through the next steps. Those are in the works right now. You'll see videos. And then uh, down the road there again with the new uh, UI UX upgrades, you're gonna be able to say, okay, independents are buying my book. Libraries are buying my book. Maybe you know the Pacific Northwest is somewhere where I'm selling my, more of my books than not. So what we're trying to do is give our publishers the most information we possibly can without crossing the lines of divulging other, another company's customer information to say, okay, this is where I need to, you know, maybe hone my marketing efforts in. Like, I do really well in libraries. I didn't know I was. I'm going to take and do more advantageous advertising through the library channels. Or, wow, I sell a lot of books in the Pacific Northwest. I didn't know that that's where I was selling. Maybe that'd be a good opportunity for me to, to call on stores there or go do a tour there because I'm obviously selling books. And Justine, if you want to talk a little bit more about that advanced reporting, because I know that's something that you're heavily involved in. Yes. So this is, this is my, my baby. Um, so we are, this is something that we are actively working on because I truly understand that this is a, uh, a challenge for everyone. Um, we are working on getting on making the reports easier to pull so that not everything has to be emailed to you. We are working on giving you more information so and making that information readily available to you at a glance so that it is all available to you in your dashboard. Um, we are trying to put heat maps in there and fun things like that. So we this is something that is actively being worked on at the moment. And so hopefully it will be available to you next year. So uh, that is where we're at with reporting. And if you did reach out to customer support and ask them for the steps on um, on how to run a report, they'll send you a knowledge base article, which will walk you through it. But we're just trying to do it in a more um, active manner to where it's there on the screen as you're doing it. And as Justine said, on a dashboard, that's a lot more easily digestible than just running PDF reports that are emailed to you. And <clears throat> Justine, I see that you're answering this question, but I think it is one that a lot of people have yeah. about returnable books. So something I think people run into is somebody orders like a bookstore orders 2000 books, they return them. And suddenly the, the, the publishers like, Oh my God, like I'm bankrupt because I can't cover that. So they were saying maybe there could be like a limit to what people can like an option on Ingram spark. That's like a limit. Uh, is there anything in the works like that? No, no, but I, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll take that one too. Uh, just coming from the independent bookstore world. So a lot of times, especially for indie authors, now mid-sized publishers with a larger catalog, it's a little bit different because you have a wider range of products to be bought. But, any, but either way, with independent bookstores themselves, as an indie author, indie publisher on one title, a great, great, great sell is three copies to one location. A very, very, very good sell is one copy, especially for indie authors. Now, I'm not talking about the, the folks with bigger catalogs who are, who are really, really out there working it in a different manner. But you're not going to see large quantities of books sold to the independents um, on a, on a one-off store basis. And usually, if you are selling into the stores, you know which store, no, nobody's just buying 2,000 books just because they're like, oh, I like that cover. I'm going to bring in 2,000 copies. They have talked to you. You've done some marketing. You've done some kind of work to entice that sale to take place. And so on, um, there again, that's where we talk about being retailer agnostic. If you know that you've made a big sale to a bookstore and they've brought in some books, your marketing should be directing folks to that bookstore and to their online site to buy the book so that you move the product. Where you really start getting down that path of large orders like you're talking about is like a Barnes and Noble. It's Amazon. 
Well, Amazon as well. Amazon bringing in stock because all of a sudden they've got all these high pre-order demands because you did a really good job marketing the book on the way out. And now Amazon is bringing in stock because they want to cover that sell and so or cover all the pre-orders and plus have stock on hand for the other books that are coming. So Amazon is definitely one there again where you can really bite yourself because you're driving so much traffic to such a big giant. And they're all they're doing is making sure that they are covered on stock, regardless of who the publisher is. But if you talk to somebody like a Barnes and Noble, who I work with on a weekly basis, then the New York team there, um, the New York buying team, they are very aware that they are working with an independent publisher. If you tell them that, if you say, hey, I'm an indie author, indie publisher, and I know you're interested in my book, but I want you to know that I need you to be very selective about your buying process. They will very much take that into account. It's just that, you know, 2,000 copies to a Barnes and Noble is not very many books to them because they have so many low massive locations across the country, just like the Amazon, that buying two or 3,000 copies is not much off, you know, not much skin to them because they know that they have the places and venues to sell it. But you were completely correct in that that return to you can definitely cripple a publisher. We have some big box stores now that we've worked with in the past that if they do, it's in place that if they buy more than a certain quantity of an indie author title, we make that publisher sign an affidavit to say, hey, I understand X, um, you know, X retailers wanting to buy this many copies of our book. I'm going to sign off on that. It's OK to happen. But if they don't, then we will not make that sell to the publisher because that very scenario came up where we had somewhere like a Costco, maybe or, you know, another type of big box retailer that was purchasing books in large amounts, but they're not a traditional place to sell books. And so the books would get returned and it's really crippled some mom and pop uh, publishing folks over the years. So we put those uh, in place for, for some of the larger retailers to say, hey, you know, this is an independent author, independent publisher. We need them to sign off on this order. It's just not across the board uh, within Ingram. And there again, that's, that's Ingram accommodating their customer base. It's not anything that Ingram Spark has control over because we're just fulfilling the orders as they come in. And I'll say this during COVID Amazon, Amazon's algorithms were crazy and we saw crazy buys in May of 2020 and then crazy returns from them in June of 2020 because they didn't know what to do and there's no way to stop Amazon from buying. And so if you're going to go returnable, you please know that there is a risk to going returnable. Absolutely. And so if you do not want to take on that risk, then please do non-returnable. And if you do decide to take on the risk of going returnable, I always suggest keeping 30% of your profits every month in a fund for if those returns do come back. And so that is, that is my, and you might want to even go higher on that. So mm -hmm. that is my advice because there is no way to stop them from happening. Yeah. And what Justine is talking about there is what we call in the distribution world, especially on the larger scale publishers is return reserve. And this is what traditional publishers do as well, because they also with their massive catalogs and massive reach have massive returns and they take anywhere from 30 to 40% of their publisher compensations or their, their payments for these sales and they just keep them in a savings account right there for that specific reason. They don't go buy cars or new toys or anything like that. They keep that money stocked and saved for these returns. And Justine made a very good point that we talked about earlier. Know your business model. Know your publishing model. If you've got books that you know aren't really going to be made for the retail market and you know that those sales are going to be online, it's, it's okay to go returnable because an online transaction is different than a, a retailer or a library buying your book. Libraries returns are, they return less than 1% of the books they buy because they're buying to keep them in circulation and to have them on hand. So libraries on the return status is not as important to them as it is the retailers like a Barnes and Noble or an independent bookstore who's taking a gamble on buying your book because they're not the final reader. They're hoping that final end user, that final reader comes in and buys from them on the stock that they invested in. So honestly, if you really don't see that book being fit for the retail market, and not every one of them are, then you can go non-returnable and just cut out that risk of returns if, no matter what, whether Amazon or an online retailer buys them at all. And then think about going returnable on your titles that you are marketing and selling to the independent bookstores, because you should have a different model, a different marketing approach based on the market that you're targeting. It's not one shotgun approach fits all. You're either marketing to readers and driving them and helping dictate their purchasing uh, habits, or you're marketing to retailers and libraries who you want to bring the book in. 
So it's two different approaches and you should have a different business model for each of your titles. It shouldn't be just a one, you know, one shot approach across the, across the bow there. In terms of the return versus non-returnable though, are bookstores not going to even try to buy your book if it's listed as non-returnable? Absolutely. So what a bookstore needs is they need that regular discount and the return status to bring the book in on the shelves. Now, if I walked into an independent bookstore and I order a book that's non-returnable, the bookstore still has access to buying it as a special order and saying, hey, uh, customer, I see that you want this title. I just hope you know that I'm selling it to you in a non-returnable status. Mm-hmm. And the reader says, okay, cool. That's the book I want anyway. I'm not, I didn't plan on returning it. And then the bookstore just facilitates the order. They bring it in as a special order and go on. But if I wanted that bookstore, if I was an author talking to a bookstore about carrying it on their shelves, that's when the return status becomes a, a game player because they have not sold that book yet. You're asking me to bring it in, but you're not guaranteeing I can sell it. And then I need to be able to return it in case it doesn't sell. But yes, absolutely. Even online. That's what I'm saying is even if you make the, the book non-returnable and you're directing people to an independent bookstore or barnesandnoble.com to buy the book, that is the reader buying the book. So it's the end user. You're, you're cutting the risk out of that situation for everybody involved. Um, it's just when you start wanting to see the books on the shelves, that's, that's really, really when it gets important. But yeah, a bookseller ultimately wants to see it returnable. But if it's special orders or online sales, the end reader is, using, is the one buying it anyway. And uh, I, I want to keep track of time. So maybe I'll do like one more question um, that seems popular. Um, people were asking about uh, volume printing. So is there a different tier, say like a thousand plus books? Um, how do people access this volume printing and, and support? Say that one more time, Christopher, sorry. Yeah, uh, so they were saying, I, I can read it directly. Um, they said, is there a different tier for volume printing, say 1000 plus books? How do we ac- access this volume printing and support? Yes, so we have what we called extended service. And so if you go to that print and ship calculator that I mentioned earlier uh, at ingramspark.com, when you will ask you for the specs of the book. So you would have to enter all the specs of the book and then the quantity. So if anything over 750 copies is uh, available for that discount. And so if you put 750 or above, one of the options that is going to come up under service level when you click calculate is going to be extended service. If you click the button next to extended service, you're going to see your price drop considerably because this is our offset pricing. And so it's going to take a lot longer for the books to print, but you're going to get a lot cheaper price per unit. So that is how you would get that option. Okay. I was going to say, I see a question in here that comes up a lot too. Can you use Ingram Spark and Amazon KDP? Absolutely. Um, that, that's going to be your way of reaching your widest discoverability. If you've ever seen us at shows pre-COVID, that was something we talked about a lot, is that we're non-exclusive. The way that you use both companies is you have to own your own ISBN. It can't be a free ISBN that was given to you by us or KDP. They do free ISBNs as well. And you can't, what happens is if you go to Ingram, say you go to Amazon KDP first, and you upload your title and you own your ISBN and you sign up for their expanded distribution, which is their reach to bookstores and libraries, that is actually Ingram that they're reaching. So what you're doing is your book is entering the Ingram ecosystem as an Amazon KDP title, but Amazon KDP titles sell through Ingram at the short discounts that we mentioned earlier. So retailers don't get their full discount and they're always non-returnable, they're never returnable. So if you're trying to reach both markets and you're already with Amazon KDP, then absolutely, you would want to use Ingram Spark as well. That way, you can control the, the return status and you can control the discount being set. And you were reaching the market that we reach, which is everybody outside of Amazon, including Amazon. So, what I tell folks is if you want to have the most largest uh, reach possible, then yeah, use both of us. I mean, there's no reason not to. We're non exclusive. But if you're only going to use one of us, then I think Ingram Spark is the better option for one only because your book also reaches Amazon plus all these other markets. And so it's just a matter of, you know, whether you want to have two different setups at two different companies running your print book. But there again, even if Amazon, even if you're using Amazon KDP and Ingram Spark, Amazon is going to source that book from the place that gives them the quickest turnaround time. So just because your book is listed with KDP doesn't mean that Amazon's going to source it from themselves when it sells at Amazon. 
they're going to source it from whichever source they can get the book the fastest to their end user. And a lot of times, if your book is with Ingram Spark and Amazon KDP as well, and we're just talking about print books here, if your book is with both of us, Ingram is a better, quicker option for Amazon to fill an order. So they're going to order it and source it from Ingram, even though your book is listed with KDP. So, but yes, you can absolutely use both. You just need to own your own ISBN and uh, not be signed up for the expanded distribution at Amazon. If you are already with Amazon and signed up for expanded distribution and you own your ISBN, you can open an Ingram Spark account and email customer support and say, hey, I'm an Amazon KDP customer. Here's my ISBN. I would like to move this book into my new Ingram Spark account. And we actually already have the print files because KDP is sending those print files to us in the catalog. So we can literally grab the print files out of that Amazon feed, KDP feed, and put them into your Ingram Spark account. You'll get a return message from customer support that says, hey, fill out this form, answer this information, and then we'll work with KDP to move the files over into your Ingram Spark account so that you are then using both. But yes, that is a process that we do daily as well. It's a little time consuming because we have to rely on Amazon to return messages, but it is something that we do on a daily basis. Well, you all are a wealth of knowledge. I'm thinking, can we clone you and maybe <laughs> have your clones work in customer service? And there you go. Problem solved. Yeah, the, I've talked about <laughs> uh, I've talked about doing uh, holograms, at least for all the events that are out I there. I mean, you before. all have all the answers. If people just could connect to you, then everything would be yeah. solved. But yeah, if that, I had five more minutes to keep typing. <laughs> I know, right? Like, let me tell you, um, IBPA is also, like you, you were saying, you know, like Ingram Spark, not, it's DIY. IBPA is meant to be more of kind of a consultant to help people. So if you're a member, reach out to staff, we're happy to help. But also we have a network of members who also have done all this stuff and you can then connect with them. So, you know, rather than, you know, asking sometimes the customer service of Ingram Spark, because uh, that's more kind of specific things just for Ingram Spark, uh, ask us your publishing questions and things like that um, so that, you know, we, we can help you. I just want to give people another avenue to ask questions. Yeah, it, that's what we stress so much is to network with associations like IDPA, writers associations, local writers groups, because there's so many people out there, your peers that are doing this right now and have crossed bridges that you were about to go down and, and know the pitfalls on those bridges. So as much networking as you can possibly do, uh, you know, socially connecting with other IBPA members and being able to follow them. It's just, there's just a, there's a wealth of knowledge out there. I mean, this, this is an industry that's been around since Gutenberg. So there's a lot, there's a lot of information that's out there and, uh, it, and it's just hard to absorb in one sitting. Um, I mean, we can, Justine and I could probably talk about this, and I know for a fact that we can talk about this stuff for hours and hours at a time. So it's, um, it's just a lot of info that's out there, but, but doing all you can to gather that information from experienced authors is extremely, and publishers, extremely important. Yeah, yeah. And so, and also because you all have so much knowledge, we are going to have you on the IBPA podcast as well to answer uh, some of the, the big questions about print on demand and all that. So um, any last minute words uh, before I stop the recording and uh, we, we all go our separate ways? No, I would just love to be able to, when we do do that podcast in August, is to maybe go ahead and have some of the preloaded questions beforehand that, that your members are asking the most. That way we can be able to answer even more at a time and, and be more concise in our answers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sorry that I didn't get to everyone's uh, questions in the Q&A. I, I have 25 left, but I answered 49. So I think I did pretty well. <laughs> oh yeah, good job. <laughs> um, so uh, so this, that, that's points for the tag team. Um, but if uh, Christopher, if, if there are any like other crazy questions in the Q&A that I didn't get to, please send them to me and I'll, I'll try to, to answer them and send them back yeah, to you. Just, if you could, that'd be great. And if, and I don't know if this needs to be recorded or all, but yeah, any, if you can somehow capture all the questions that came yeah. up in the Q&A, that's helpful for us because we, we can relay that information to customer support and marketing and say, look, this is what the questions that are most frequently coming up from IBP, IBPA members specifically or potential IBPA members. And let's think about ways that we can address this um, in a more streamlined way for these folks. Well, the number one question is, how did both of you get so awesome? So there you go. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Don't feed our egos anymore. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everyone for watching. We appreciate it. And uh, I'll stop the recording. Thank you.